Yes, yes, yes. It's Raps on TV again. Reporting fresh out of London. What's going on, people? I'm here with a co-host. Man like a name, fresh from his t- trip. Enjoying the life out in Turkey. What's going on, brother? I hear that. Uh, I, hear, I hear the weather's going to go back down to uh, normal standard British weather the next couple of days. So I, 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 as much as I could, man. Yeah, you've done as much as you could, man. Fighting for the team out yeah. there. Um, but yeah, definitely a busy weekend in terms of the boxing front. Um, we obviously saw the uh, the rematch that took place between Tony Belly and David Hay down in London's O2 Arena. Um, Belly obviously getting a, 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 the stoppage of Hay in, in the fifth round there. Um, also saw one of the, I guess, I guess we, it's hard to call him a prospect now, but um, essentially Joe Joyce putting on an impressive display, I thought, uh, against Thomas uh, to win the Commonwealth belt. Uh, so definitely looking forward to touching more on, uh, in terms of that, those two fights uh, in them. Yeah, so guys, uh, this week we're also joined by Maver Promotions, Ishe Smith, ex-154 pound world champ, who returns to the wing, uh, ring this weekend. Uh, we're also going to cover Triple G beating Martin Asia by second round KO. And of course, we've got a massive fight coming up between Linares and Lomachenko, which will probably determine if Linares wins becoming the top pound for pound fight on the planet. Uh, don't forget to call in on 01506 or just send us a couple of tweets and we'll pick that up as well. Yeah. Over to you, Coach. No problem, no problem. So, so listen, guys, let's get straight into it. Um, as we know, um, kind of a big fight that was billed this weekend. weekend. Um, Tony the, Bola, the Bomber Belly, you taking on David the Haymaker. Um, first fight, which we all know, went down over a year ago now. Um, and Belly got the better of David Hay, though most people believed it was down to injury and not his actual skill set. Um, so we had an opportunity to get a rematch. Uh, most... It, Rightly billed as repeat or revenge. Uh, six month delay after the initial three match was announced, uh, but we eventually got there. And whilst Inam was watching it via Turkish TV, we were all kind of waiting for the clash over over here. And uh, I think we got an explosive rematch. Um, so in terms of Hay playing the B side, I think once all the the antics were finished, uh, it's just the two of them look in the ring. That kind of think Hay started off well, um, but Inam obviously we saw Belly get the win. I mean, what was your fight on the? What was your thoughts on the fight and obviously the the, the knockout? I mean, I think like probably most people, I think I was very, very, very surprised by his performance. Um, actually, not you know, it's, it's, we're going one of two ways. I mean, that's what everyone was thinking. If he was injured and it's just a shot fighter, we would have expected what happened in the show last week. You know, my prediction was Billy by points decision. But what he showed to me is, hey, he is a shadow of his former self. Um, can't move him as much as he used to. You know, his whole thing was just to fight on his toe, moving around, explosive. That's all gone now. He was just looking for big bombs all the way through, giving himself wide open. You know, he's, he's, he looks like he's got injured, not injured leg, but he can't keep carrying any power on his leg at all. So anytime he gets hit clean or hard, he just goes down. It was a really, really sad, sad, sad ending to his career. I mean, I don't think anyone can take him seriously anymore. And, you know, when he's talking about fine people like Lysa Joshua now, he's a laughing matter. You know, he just he needs to hang up his clubs. Mm. But, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's my views on it. What about yourself? I mean, yeah, I think uh, going into it, it was a weird one in the sense of, I think it, everybody kind of just felt, well, it's all about whether he will be able to get through the fight. Um, to the highest degree of fitness in terms of no injuries um, in the fight and no injuries leading up to it. Um, for me, I think, you know, I have to say I was impressed with Bellew more in the sense of that he got the stoppage because one thing I always took from the first fight and why, why I was undecided was I didn't feel Be- Hay showed the power to knock uh, Bellew out. And I think in the first fight, he hit him with some good shots, um, but Bellew didn't wobble. So I always found that interesting, but... I didn't think Bellew could do anything against Hay, and I was massively, obviously proven wrong, and massively shocked by the way once he could he connected with the right hand, and you really got to look at it, the fight was over from the third round, um, it was only the you know, last 30 seconds of the third round, um, and Be- Hay obviously kind of evaded the full count, but he was able to get back to his corner, um, and then, you know, Bellew done the smart thing, didn't jump in, uh, just because just he saw him in pain, he kind of weighed it up, 
But then the fifth round went for the kill. And, you know, when he started landing those clear shots with no sort of defence uh, coming back in terms of a counter, uh, I, th- I thought it was, you know, it was right on the wall. And it was a good it was a good finish for Bellew. Um, I know everyone's going to talk about the injuries, but at the end of the day, he agreed to this fight. He went into it. Um is there more to it? Is Does he have issues where he needs to kind of fight on? Um, maybe, you know, he's lived that champagne lifestyle. It's not cheap. Um, not getting it, but maintaining it. So who knows? But I think overall, I think we can't take anything away from Bellew. And I also want to say, I don't okay, think we can I take... Mean, fair enough. You, know, you, mean, you, can, you can look like that from Bellew's, <coughs> Bellew's point of view. <coughs> yes, you've got a great name on this record. But the harsh and reality of the situation is this, guys, right? Take away the hype. Doesn't matter what people are predicting. Doesn't matter what people thought was going to happen. Listen, don't forget, during the fight, we also heard he was back out in Germany the week before the fight. Yeah? See the specialist plan, specialist again, right? So there's people talking about his injury again, right? So if, you remember, if you watch the fight, you know, if you watch the fight again, you hear commentators talk about that, especially when they talk about him bringing back his, his perspective conditioning course. Uh, Ruben, what his surname is. I mean, yeah, that guy's been in from the start, but yeah, and he replaced the Darren guy, uh, but yeah, 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 but yeah, 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 but what I'm trying to say is, he went to Germany again. Every time he goes to Germany, he's got to see that specialist doctor for injuries. Mm. So for that week, he's up to the fight, he did go. But again, going back to my point is, you know, there is no shadow of a doubt, right, that he's a shot fighter. There's no, you know, so, but yeah, I don't think, yeah. I think you can only say hindsight is a wonderful thing. So to say on the performance, of course, no one's going to disagree with that. But to say that beforehand... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, no, 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 I'm not saying that beforehand. I'm saying, look, it doesn't matter what people predicted, what's happened, what, the way the sold soldier fight said is in amazing shape and etc. blah, blah, blah. Take that away. I mean, the, the reality of the situation is, though, right? And this is... This, this is the way Bellew fights. But look, after the press conference, what did he say, right? He wants to fight Fury, but he won't fight Fury after two or three fights, and Fury's got his ring last two fights now. Save him all the reward. But so, and then he said it, look, right? these guys are top of their game, I will beat them. So he's looking for people that are struggling with ring rust. have been in the game for a long time, you know? I think the, in terms of certain people. opponents, but if you look at somebody like a Usyk, I'm not saying he's going to beat a Usyk, but he would fight him. So I think, yeah, you're talking about heavyweights when we know deep down he's not a heavyweight. I think, again, we need to focus on Hayes, in my opinion, Hayes' sort of frailties, uh, the weaknesses that Hay has shown, um, and the fact that, really, when it's all said and done, has Hay lived up to be a, 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 a top heavyweight? I would say no. I don't think he can go down as a top heavyweight. I think, ultimately, we saw two cruiser. We think we saw two cruiserweights. I mean, if you look at Hayes, Heavyweight career. Mm-hmm. Who did he actually beat? Well, this beat is it. Absolutely useless heavyweight champion to get the title in the first place. I mean, his biggest name Which really is Chisora. Yeah, his biggest ever heavyweight is Chisora. He's not that Chisora. So, yeah. he's not an accomplished heavyweight, right? So, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, look, right? Irrespective, you know, he's not, he wasn't the same. Benny can take credit, but he can't take credit for being a great fighter, you know? That's my thoughts. Yes. Where does Bellew go from here, Coach? I mean, for me, I think Bellew really, his only option should be to contest um, one of the, well, Yusek or Gassiv, the winner of the Super Series, in my opinion. Um, I think he's got the right because he gave up the WBC belt, which he earned. Um, so for me, I think that would, if he wants to stay competitive and he wants the big fights, I think that's the one he, he should take. Will he take it? Is it is, is, is a... Totally different question. I mean, what do you think? Where, where, where would you like to see him go? Where do you think he should go? Well, you know, you know, when he finished that, when he finished the fight, you know, he he's going on the banks, but he's one of the, you know, he's a great fighter, etc. And I think to really prove that, you've got to fight a current champion. And mm. You're right. He needs to fight the winner of the Super Series, either Gassiv or Usyk. You know, you're right. He's the WBC Emirates champion. You know, which is something about what they done to be done in Pitchco. So he's like a champion in recess. He's yes. got the right to fight the champion, whoever he calls for it. Right. Yeah. So he's got that right. He needs to call that out. Okay. Um, but he's, he's looking, you know, it's possible he's going to fight Andre Ward. An interesting match I read today. Andre Ward, he said, he's definitely up for it. He will fight Tony Bellew. Um, but he's got a couple of commitments at the moment. He's going to be, you know, he's headed the contender series of 
in America. Mm. And he's also just come off the set of Creed 2. So he said, as soon as he finishes those two commitments, he will fight Bellew. So if you had a choice fighting between him fighting Ford or the winner of Usyk, guess him, who would you prefer him to fight? So I guess the pure boxing fan in me, I think really I have to say uh, Usyk, the winner of the Super Series. Um, I think probably more... Like I'll say the fanboy in me would like to see him fight Ward because that means there's a good chance Ward's going to fight in the UK. Um, and, and, you know, you want to watch good fighters. Um, but I think really and truly, you the, the competitive edge, the one for the sport, the one where your legacy will be sort of defined is that you come back and if you beat one of the Super Series, nobody will ever be able to question your ability, the fact that you didn't have the greatest physique and all these other excuses that he kind of puts out there. I think for me... That is really um, the tougher challenge. Um, and also, I think, from a boxing point of view, I think it does more from his legacy. What do you think? Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I think, I think he needs to fight the winner of the Super Series. And if he beats them, if he beats them, then undoubtedly, it probably will go down as one of Britain's yeah. greatest cruiserweights. Yeah. There's no doubt. There's no, there's, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about it. You know, in fact, he probably got one of the greatest cruiserweights ever in Holyfield. Yeah, he can definitely you know, he can, he'll so, put his name up there. You know, so that's a legacy-defining fight. And as Eddie Hogan said, right, he's now secured his name in the future, indefinitely, mm. financially. You know, he has, to some extent, sealed his legacy as well with this, with the hay fight. Yeah. And what I mean, about hey? Uh, if I finish on that one, yeah, yeah, sorry, bro. There's an article put out today uh, regarding Barry Hearn's comments regarding Wilder, etc. Joshua. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Mashu, they play, you know, they, they're very much, they're very commercial and they put into the mindset the commercial aspect, right? So I think with every fight now, they look at pound for pound what they're going to earn the most for mm. the fighter, right? So at this stage of his career, I think that's what Ben is going to be looking at. I don't think it's going to be, I don't think he's overly concerned about his legacy when it comes to securing money. Yeah. The big, my bigger money fight would be probably the board fight. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and he can't take the board fight if he loses to Usyk. Mm. Okay. So those are going to be the factors. You know, I mean, the the fight, the the Super Series final, I think is what is it in September. I, I, for some reason, I thought it was July, but it could be September. I have to okay, be honest. I don't know, June, July, July. Is that it's the uh, middleweight. It's no, middle it's the middleweight. Yeah, so yeah, it's probably September then, yeah. Yeah, so it might, I think it's September. So, you know, after September, that means you'd have to wait another maybe three, four months, four, five months to the winner of that. So it's possible. Yeah. It's possible in terms of timing. You know, it depends which one is the, which one will come quicker. But, yeah, I mean, I would like him to just fight, fight. Uh, the winner of the World Super Series. Yeah, no, definitely. And in terms of hey, I mean, I think he's just retired, man. Yeah. You know, he's done enough damage. He's done enough damage to his legacy. A lot of a lot of fans these days, right? They're just coming into sport now. Mm. Yeah. A lot of them, you know, it's a lot of casual fans now. Jumping on, you know. If you go back, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, right, and you look at kind of commentary on Facebook, you know, the social media activity of it wasn't that much. Mm. Right? It's a very recent phenomenon, especially in the UK, right? So what's gonna happen is a lot of the vast majority of modern fans, right, they're not gonna truly appreciate who they want. Yeah. Right? So when they've seen this performance, it's gonna go down with a really bad name, mm. right? With a lot of these fans, right? So you shouldn't tarnish shit anymore. I think he just needs to retire. He's probably made enough money from these two fights. Concentrate on his promotions and just go from there. That's my view. I mean, I'll do you sure. think? Do you do you think? Um, no, I, 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 I mean, I do want to say agree, but yeah, I think I don't see how he really comes back. I get that he is a name, um, but in terms of competitive fights, it's not going to happen, especially at heavyweight division. Maybe a cruiserweight. weight. Um, maybe I that he could, but I think it's clear. That his body's not going to take it. So anybody elite level is going to w- wipe him out. Um, as Bellew did. And um, for me, I just think, yeah, he has to retire. Um, I think one of the, the questions I was going to ask you. Do you think it was telling that um, he has never sparred Joe Joyce? Knowing that, you know, he's, he's his protege. 
He's bringing him through the ranks. Given Joe Joyce's performance on Saturday, um, and I admit I wasn't one of his biggest fans, but um, given that performance on Saturday, do you think that th- there's a reason why Hay avoided sparring Joyce? Yeah, I mean, look, man, Hay's hey, hey, career has been built on being a salesman. He's a salesman. He sells events. Right? He's fights their events. And he sells the fights that he fights. The reason a lot of people brought him to this fight is probably because of what he was saying, you know. Um, you know, he's back, he's never felt so good, etc., etc. But deep down, he doesn't, he doesn't know, what's, you know where he is. And I think he probably knows at this stage of his career, he's not going to truly add anything to Joe Joyce by sparring with him. Mm. Yeah? Joe Joyce is a proper heavyweight, he's an Olympic finalist, you know, he's coming up strong, he's knocking people out, you know. David Hayes, whole crew was built on being fast and explosive. That's gone. It's gone. Exactly. So, yeah, you know, you know, now you say that, you know, yeah, he probably wouldn't, he probably wouldn't add anything. You know, what's he going to add to, to go and join? What is he, what is he going to teach him by sparring with him? Exactly. No, I, 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 I agree with you on that. So, listen, I'm going to open up the lines, uh, get a few of the callers out there and um, get some of their opinions. Uh, so, going out to a man like D, Daniel, I see you there. <laughs> uh, hello? Yeah, not bad, oh, thanks, bro. You alright? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. All good, good fellas. Good, good, all good. 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 What are you making of boxing this weekend? Uh, yeah, you know what? Absolutely terrific performance by Tony Bellew. I thought he um, boxed well. I thought he was patient. I think he looked like a top fighter in there. Um, he's not everyone's cup of tea, right? And, uh, yeah, David Hay is a shot fighter. Tony Bellew done what he had to do. And uh, he um, he battered David Hay. Absolutely destroyed him. And, uh, yeah, that's it. Simple and short. Like, he's done the business. And hopefully... Um, That was a, it was a good good fight overall. Um, did you watch any of the Triple G fight? Or did you get any catch any of the highlights? No, I, I didn't. Um, he won in the second round, didn't he? Yeah, he won in the, the second round, round yeah. So um, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. get into that a bit later. Yeah. So listen, D, we're going to leave you to it. Um, but definitely we'll speak soon. And uh, like I said, next week we've got you in the studio. So uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, lovely stuff. See you All right, soon. Take, take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Uh, All right, going out to Tom. Man like Tom, what's going on, bro? You alright? Coach and Ann. How you guys doing? Uh, doing? How are you doing, mate? Yeah, not too bad. Good, good, good. Did you enjoy the boxing this weekend? Yeah, very good weekend of boxing. Uh, very impressed with uh, Bellew's performance. I felt he um, the jab dictated the pace uh, of the fight from round one. Uh, once he got a uh, hate number um, within the first few rounds, it was 
a fairly easy job for him and uh, yeah, yeah dominant performance Oh no, good. I mean, you spoke there about like the jab, which I felt that it was that he definitely he kind of established that earlier. And I felt hey started the round. I say it better, but I, th- I felt he looked okay. He seemed to be a bit agile. Um, he th- seemed to have a bit of energy in the performance. And, and and I'm talking sort of like rounds one and two. Um, but what do you think about sort of Bellew's uh, punch variety um, when he smelt the blood, um, bringing in that right hand, work it going down to the body. Um, even when he got inside up up close throwing shots. Well, what did you make of that? Yeah, I was um, impressed with his inside game. I felt that when he uh, tied Hay up on the inside, he was able to um, you know get his combinations off and then as he backed Hay onto the ropes, um, was able to, you know, be patient when he walked him down and then as Hay was on the ropes be able to pick him off and um, I thought his upper body movement was impressive. Um, the fact that, you know, he wasn't looking for that one punch. He was trying to systematically break Hay down. And uh, as the rounds uh, progressed, it um, paid dividends. Yeah. I mean, that's that's an interesting comment because Hearn said sort of uh, the at the weigh-in that Hay was saying to Belly, I'm going to break you down, make it last, make it a painful beat down. And when I heard that, it was interesting because you kind of felt to yourself, can he really do that? Is his body going to allow him to do that can he rely on his body to, in that sense which I guess you could take as a sign of confidence but clearly he was wrong um, I mean what do you see from Hay moving forward yeah I think and that's something that perfectly I think um, you know Hay likes to sell himself you know sell the fight and get people you know um, get the hype uh, around him but I think now that you know his legacy's sort of been um, tarnished in a way because going to be remembered now for those two defeats that nobody expected against um, Bellew and um, if he was to continue which I don't see um, any way possible for him to uh, continue no one's going to buy into it you know if he ends up fighting um, a name like Derek Chisora on a you know top of the bill on Dave or something like that no one's really going to buy into um, him anymore and there's not going to be any interest you know generated by having another comeback because of what's yeah, I mean, who's going to have to persuade a channel like, who's going to have to persuade a TV channel like Dave that people are going to watch his fights? I mean, pay-per-view fights are over. No one is going to pay money to watch your pay. I mean, would you pay £20 to watch him coach again? No, no, no. There you go. So pay-per-view is probably most likely gone, right? If he's not going to get a pay-per-view fight. question is, <clears throat> can he buy terrestrial TV channels? Possibly, you know, possibly. Even the short fighter like David Hay, or something like Dave, I probably would watch him. He's got nothing else to do on a Saturday. Why not? I mean, you know. the the thing is, it's the really it's got to be the effects of Joe Joyce now because if we're looking at the brand Haymaker, um, and for him, I guess for Hay, for act for Hay, it is actually over. It's now talking about the fighters that are under him. Hutchinson's obviously uh, left the stable, so it is really Joe Joyce they're going to be banking on. Um, I know this Cody Davis has just come through, um, but Joyce is the one. I mean, where do we see? How does this impact Joyce? Um, knowing that now he, he doesn't really have a relationship with a with, with with a big network, really. So Joe Joyce, I think, yeah, you're right. He, he's, he's, he's only hope, and he's moving up really, really fast. Uh, I mean, I, 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 again, for this weekend's performance, I don't think we'll be too much into it. It's only when people start fighting serious challenges that's when we can see what someone's about. I think they need to make that Chisora fight. Mm. If he beats Chisora as comprehensively as he's been in Len Roy Thomas and all the other guys he's fought, then I think, yeah, you know, he can do it. Because he's always been a bit of a slow prodding fighter for me. Yeah. No I mean, you know, that's an interesting slow. one. Sorry, carry on, bro. You know, he's quite slow and prodding. You know, the kind of style he's got, it's not like a Joshua will damage him, I think. You know, it'll be too quick, too powerful for him very, very quickly. The deal will get wound up, it will take him out again. You know, that slow prodding style just doesn't work. Um, so I think, you know, he's just probably going to, still going to get high into the rankings, but I can't see him becoming a world champion with the current champions that are fighting at the moment. I mean, as an ending statement, I think it's very hard to disagree with that. Um, what I will say is I was impressed with Joyce, um, really in terms of the fact that he took out Lenroy Thomas uh, so early. Um, and really, it was you could argue, again, it was a first-round 
performance because from the first from the first sort of like minute um he literally just took over um and he had a uh, great in terms of his shot variety um jab uppercuts working the body uh trying to put a little bit of switch hitting in um defense low uh in terms of can he stop the elite guys Joshua Wilder highly unlikely um but I'll say this much if you want to use the narrative of resumes um he's quickly building one of the strongest he- resumes in the heavyweight division so I want to see how people kind of argue that one as, as as being relevant but for me um I was surprised um I think Chisora doesn't want the fight um after seeing that and I say that is because Chisora is obviously pricing himself out um asking for a high fee um and and Joe Joyce isn't going to get this kind of money now now that hey doesn't you know he's he, the brand is kind of finished he's not going to be generating the funds um but yeah, for me, I have to say, Neymar, I was I like Joe Joyce. I was impressed with him, um, a bit massively. Um, Tom, what did you? What was your what thoughts? You yeah, um, just before I go on to the uh, Joyce part, I just wanted to say in regards to um, the sparring situation with Hay not using Joyce as a you know prime sparring partner for his camp. I think what takes over a lot of the time is I think you know his uh, Hay's pride definitely takes over a lot and. Um, the fact that you know he wasn't sparring um, someone like Joe Joyce, who is regarded as a four fight novice, uh, definitely demonstrated that he didn't want to reveal any um, chinks in his armor, or you know have any um, you know difficulties with sparring a younger, fresher heavyweight um, in the leader. And that's why I think he's you know only brought in say one or two sparring partners. Uh, we had Malik Scott, who didn't give a very good account of himself against Luis Ortiz. And um, that probably just showed that, you know, the lack of um, time he had sparring during camp played a massive part. Um, whether that was injury-based or not, um, we'll never know. But I just want to quickly add to that point, though. But I think, like, Joe Joyce doesn't resemble Bellew in any way, shape or fashion. So I don't think he could have added anything to any kind of tactic or or given, given Hay any kind of idea of how the fight was and they aren't fighting someone like uh, Joe Joyce. They're very, very different fighters, you know. Yeah. And that's that will cut I think that will definitely be a factor in there. Yeah, I mean, opinion. so yeah, just quickly, call, um, Tom, because we've got um, the get, we've got to have our guest on the line. Um, what are your thoughts on Joyce? Yeah, Joyce is very, uh, very impressive. And as you said, um, he's starting to build up a good resume for himself and just, um, you know, four fights having uh, captured the Commonwealth title. He looks to be progressing very well and I think there was um, back and forth today on Twitter with himself and um, Avery Miller uh, Jerome Miller so okay. um, you know he's definitely calling out the big guns in the division and I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a, a big fight um, you know the way he's uh, his career has been fast tracked and the way he's progressing at the moment yeah no definitely listen Tom thank you very much for calling in appreciate the support as always um, I'm going to move yeah, over no worries to- anytime Appreciate that. Going to move on over to our guest. Um, so today we have with us uh, a, a, a Vegas native. Um, a lot of boxing fans will remember uh, this, this this fighter from the boxing TV show, The Contender. Um, he's a Las Vegas native who beat Cornelius Bundridge for the IBF Super Worldweight title. Um, signed to affiliation management and is a great example of perseverance. Um, he will be fighting... Tony Harrison this weekend, um, and we've got him on the line to just talk about camp and how things are going. Ishe Smith, thank you very much for joining us. Ishe, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How's everything going? We're doing well. We're doing well. Thank you very much. Um, here with my co host, Inam. Ishe, thank you very much for giving us the time to come to our show. Oh, no problem, man. No problem. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. So, Ishe. Yeah, so how how's camp been uh, going into this fight? Uh, uh, camp has been going pretty. Uh, camp has been awesome. Uh, it's probably I hate the cliches, so I'm gonna say it again. It's probably been one of my better camps. I said it with uh, the Julian Williams fight, and uh, that was a great camp and a great fight. And uh, this has just been uh, a great camp as well. We left no stone uh, unturned and. And no, uh, no corner, not maneuvered, and uh, it's been a, it's been an excellent camp, man. It's been great. Oh, 
no, that, that's good. And um, obviously this weekend you're fighting Tony Harrison um, over in Vegas on, on, on a Friday, this Friday. Um, how, how would you assess Harrison as a fighter? He's a good kid, uh, good little fighter. Um, uh, he's just trying to get his feet wet, you know, it's, you know, he's like everybody else I've fought. I've been in this game for almost two decades. I was fighting Randall Bailey when I had 13 fights. So everybody's like, oh, he has power, he has this. And, you know, when I fought Julian Williams, people said Julian Williams was going to knock me out or he was going to just run through me. And then when that didn't happen, then after the fight, a lot of people thought I won. They said, oh, Julian Williams ain't got nothing left. Now Julian Williams goes in and beats Nathaniel Gallimore in his last fight. Now he's back. So the boxing community is a little bit uh, fickle. It's just time for um, people to just give me my credit. You know, I, w- I became world champion. I made history, and I can fight. You know, the fighters that I've lost to are, 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 are good fighters. You know, they were good fighters, and some of them are still fighters today, like Danny Jacobs and Sergio Moore. Um, it's just people, it's time for people to just start giving me my credit, man. It's just... Uh, Becoming the first-born Las Vegas world champion as many fighters uh, that come out of this city, um, to, to be the first one to do it, it says a lot, and uh, I'm ready to go. Uh, he's a good kid, good fighter, but he's not on my level. There's no fighter's going to beat me. That's, every time he steps up, he gets knocked out. So that's just what it is. Oh, nice. Like, uh, you say, so you say, uh, it's in a, uh, again, thanks for coming to our show. I remember watching the contender many, many years ago as a young man, you know, until he's come on late in the UK. And I remember the whole thing you had with uh, Sergio, the Latin, uh, Latino, Snake Bora, etc. And he wanted to win it and win, the, win that million dollars. How did you get into boxing following that show? Because there's quite a few names. You had Peter Manfredo. I think it was Peter, Peter Manfredo was also in that one. You had Sergio Mora and yourself. And you were in the professional ranks. How did you get into boxing? Oh, I, I started boxing when I was eight years old from uh, being bullied in, in school. And um, that's why I speak out against bullying today. But uh, me being bullied actually uh, helped this career that I have now, this long career that I have now. So, um, you know, that's how it all started. And, you know, being part of that contender was a, a great platform for me and guys like Peter Manfredo and Sergio Mora. And Alfonso Gomez, and, you know, those guys, and, and I'm mean, Ecuador, who I fought on the show. Um, it was just a great uh, platform and a great launch to, uh, you know, to get us more fans and, and, and get us recon- uh, rec- recognized, you know. So it was, it was wonderful. I wouldn't trade that in for the world. What was it like leading up to the world title win against Bundraj? And, and what, what did it feel like becoming a world, t- world title win? a world champion for the first time in your career? Well, you know, when I when they, call me, when they told me about the fight and they told me I had to go to his backyard to do it, I said, let's make it happen. I had, I had waited 13 years for my opportunity and I finally got it. And um, camp was going good. And, you know, this little kid in camp called me. Um, he hit me with a, a weird body shot. It wasn't even hard. It just hit me, like, in the right spot. And I had this bruise rib for like the last two weeks of camp I couldn't spar and um, I remember Floyd coming in the gym asking me if I wanted to pull out and I said hell no I was like you know I waited 13 years I don't know when this opportunity is going to come back again so I fought uh, Bunner in his backyard with the bruised rib and still was able to overcome um, all of that so it was just a, it was the best feeling I tell people it's the best feeling in the world outside of you know my children being born you know seeing a, a woman give birth to your kids is uh, something you help create together is probably the best thing that can ever happen to a man and you know outside of that that was a, a great feeling man mm. uh, we, we've been following your career for a while we say you know you know, I did, we did see you in the contender so we have known your name for a while we're actually we're in, we're in Vegas doing Manny Pacquiao versus uh, Floyd Mayweather. We're actually in the Palms Casino when you were fighting on the app. It was a Spike TV on the channel. Um, can you see yourself fighting for a world title again? Um, I mean, if, if I'm just here, just here to to, to fight and, and not try to get one of the big names in the future, then what what are you doing it for? So. 
Yeah. I definitely am, am gunning for one of those world titles. And, you know, first, you gotta take, I got to take care of business what's in front of me. But I want to fight the best. And, and Tony Harrison is one of the best. Julian Williams is one of the best. But, uh, you know, it's, the judging is, is a little bit crazy in boxing nowadays. I would like to uh, hopefully get some competent judges this time out. But, uh, yeah, I want to fight the best. And he's one of the best. And after that, when I'm victorious here, we'll see what's, what's next for us. Hi, Isha, it's Kojo here. And uh, in terms of for, for our listeners that will be watching on Friday, I mean, how would you describe your style as a boxer? And I guess what kind of a performance are you looking to, to put on, on on the Friday night? Oh, man. You know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, uh, I've had this up and down career. And, uh, you know, and, you know, tw- almost 20 years in, the Julian Williams fight, people were saying that was like my best fight. And um, I-, I seem to be getting better with age. You know, I'm just doing all the right things in the ring and outside of the ring, and which is crazy because you don't see guys with 18-year um, pro careers. You know, it's hard to even have a 10-year pro career, let alone 18 years. So, um, I don't know. I just make the adjustments and I adapt however I need to adapt, but what's good thing about me is I have so much experience is that it's not a style I haven't seen, it's not nothing I haven't experienced in the ring. Um, I adapted with the headbutts for my last fight, Julian Williams headbutted me three times and I had you know, two cuts, two uh, brutal cuts that were was messing up my vision, but I was able to adapt in there just from the experience I had. I have. So, I'm you know, I'm just ready to whatever he brings. I'll be ready for it, and I'm I'm ready to go. Nice. Uh, Ishii, how did you how did you meet Floyd Mayweather for the first time? How did you break in with Mayweather Promotions? And just so other fighters out there understand the importance of networking and meeting the right people in boxing, what did Mayweather Promotions do for you in boxing to help you break through to those world title fights? Well, you know, um, Leonard that would be. Um, you know, he gave me a he gave me a chance when uh, a lot of people wouldn't and, and wouldn't take a lot of wouldn't give me a chance. Uh, back in 2012, he knew I wasn't active and he knew I hadn't had many fights. And uh, you know, I wasn't able to get any fights. And uh, he came and took a chance on me. And uh, the whole the whole game plan was to get a title shot. And uh, here we are, six years later, and still headlining cards and still fighting. So. They uh they took a chance on me and I've seen them take a chance on a lot of people and they they stuck by people um, even when they're in defeats and you know it's a business so I do appreciate them and, and elevating my um, second half of my career and, and helping me achieve my goals but the the work is far from done we still have a lot of work left and I still have a lot of fighting me left and uh, I'm looking to finish my career here. How many more years do you think you can stay in boxing at the top level, you say? Um, I don't know, man. I found the found the youth, so maybe five. <laughs> I was thinking maybe two or three, but I don't know, man. I feel I feel good, almost like I feel better today than I did when I was a young kid, and which is crazy. Even sparring and training, and just seem to be eating right and doing everything, doing everything right. I have a great team behind me, and. Um, it's, I don't know, maybe five, uh, three, five, maybe. I don't know. I'm just going to keep going, and, you know, the more successful we are, the, the good fights we're in, uh, I'll just, uh, I don't want to have a plan to get out of here. It's just, you don't know when it's time to go, but I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it right now. Well, good luck to you, Shay, with that. Good. Who is the top 154 pound fighter in your opinion right now? Uh, well, the top guy you gotta say is Jared Hurd because he beat the guy who was who who, who, was, who was the guy. So mm-hmm. Lar was the guy, 154 pounds. Jared Hurd beat him. So if you beat the guy, that's the guy. You 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 become the guy. So I gotta give it to him. Yeah, no, okay. and uh, it's definitely a competitive div- division that you're in. Um, in terms of um, uh, your you, your 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 personality outside of the ring, um. We, uh, or I, I know Ashley Theophane, he's a previous guest of ours on the show. Um, yourself, uh, Ashley and Baddy Jack, you got a close brotherhood. Um, how important are your stories for, 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 for boxing? 
you know, young amateurs coming up, people that are currently trying to make a way in the game. How important are your stories? I think the, the stories that um, I have and, and that I actually have and that if I do may have, a, you know, those are very important, especially my story and, you know, dealing with uh, depression and suicide, you know, early in my career and uh, just through all the ups and downs and being able to overcome that and, and become world champion and still fight today and still live in today. Those are very important, especially for the amateurs and, and, and professionals. You know, this is a hard game. It's, it's, uh, it's crowded at the top. It's lonely at the bottom. You know, you got many friends when you're at the top. And you hardly have no friends when you're at the bottom. And it's, it's those sacrifices and, and um, that you make when you're at the, the bottom and you find out who your true friends are to pull yourself out of it. So I think those stories are very important. Yeah, no. And definitely we've been, uh, as you know, most of our listeners will see uh, the, the, the good, what we call banter, between the three of you, um, and I think the me- most memorable one will be Ashley when he was in the ice bucket. So um, yeah, definitely, uh, we're good oh, to yeah, see you guys. That was great. Yeah, have some good stories. <clears throat> <clears throat> three guys from different parts of the world, all working to kind of make their dreams uh, come true. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Inam spoke about working with Mayweather, um, but being in that camp of Vegas, we've been out to Vegas. I mean, staying focused. Um, I mean, it, you, you know, your family must be very important in supporting you, uh, you know, achieve your dreams of this boxing career. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, if you don't have the right family behind you to, to guide you and to, to push you and to tell you to keep going, I mean, I've had, you know, great, great women um, who supported my career, even, you know, past, past women and, you know, my ex-wife who, who uh, ended up getting murdered uh, last year, my kid's mother and uh, my current fiance, they have all been, uh, you know, great in, in helping me get what I need to get. So I, I think that's very important to have the right family behind you pushing. Yeah. And I mean, I've, Isha, I mean, obviously we knew, but we did hear about that and wasn't sure how to approach it. So, you know, from us, definitely, you know, a lot of respect for returning to the ring after such a tragedy. And, um, you know, for your family, you know, deepest condolences and sympathy uh, definitely go out to, to, to the mother of your children. And, you know, hopefully that, you know, the pain just erases or, or eases as the days move on. Um, but definitely I'll say, you know, all oh, the best. Um, all the best for this Friday. So before we let you go, um, just want to say, uh, do you want to quote your social media handles um, and just tell the listeners where you'll be fighting this Friday? I'll be fighting at Sam's Town and uh, Sam Town Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, nine, uh, I, I don't know the times per se, but I know we'll be on Bounce TV. You can watch it online, stream it on the Brown Sugar app. Um, you know, this Friday, May mm-hmm. 11th, and my handles are Ishe Sugar Shea on like on every platform on Twitter, on Snapchat, on Instagram, and Ishe Smith on Facebook. Perfect. Thank you very much. All the best for Friday night. Ishe, thank, thank you. Good luck the rest of your career, man. Good luck the rest of your career. Thank you. I appreciate you, it. You've you done fantastic. Going for the content that's gone world champion. What you've done for your career. Good luck, mate. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, great interview there with uh, Ishe Smith, giving us some great insight into his career. Um, And obviously, he's fighting this weekend, this Friday. uh, So make sure you check that out. Um, We'll be available online uh, for a live stream. Um, So, yeah, we're also going to kick off a couple of other bits and pieces that happened this weekend. Um, Was a busy card uh, that took place at the London O2. Um, So we saw James Tennyson stop uh, Martin J. Ward. Uh, Tennyson won by knockout. Um, great, great knockout. Um, he recovered from a vicious body shot quite early on to stop Ward. Um, and I think he showed a great display of his power, which was definitely serving well in his division. And now, what did you make of the Buatsi fight? Yeah, another great display for Buatsi. Good fight on his journey. You know, the Frenchman did test Buatsi a few, few, few times to some get good headshots, but again, fantastic performance from Buatsi. And, Looking like he's going to head on to go one of the best light heavyweights in this country. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, Ryder, do you want to talk about the Ryder? Yeah, uh, the Ryder fight uh, is a great, great, great matchup. It was billed as a uh, last resort for both fighters. Cops coming 
into the fight on the back of a vicious stoppage by uh, John Gross in the Super Series. And John Ryder moving up from middleweight to super middleweight. I think he had a couple of fights in super middleweight. Um, he was expected to be explosive. And, and, and it, it did end that way. He was a bit of a surprise, I have to say, the way clocks went down from that, so, you know, uh, to the forehead. It was a bit of a delayed reaction. Yeah. You know, he was standing up and then suddenly he just went down. It didn't look like such a hard punch, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so I'm just surprised how he stayed down for the entire 10 count. 10 count. And uh, I think that raised a few questions for his kid. Do you want to yeah. just quickly add to that? Yeah, I mean, for me, I did think when I saw... I think watching it live, it was very difficult to that kind of spot. Um, but on the replays, clearly, I felt that where he was hit, sort of like at the back of that head range in between the temple, I felt it was just one of those things where he got a shock to the system and... That's kind of exactly how we felt. He looked like his brain kind of was on reset. Um, and he was just trying to work out what all his muscles were doing. Um, hence why he missed the 10 count. Um, I mean, I think, I know people were moaning and saying, I'll oh, let you get up and count to 10. But I'm like, what's the point? You know, if you're already that close and he was kneeling down on nine, nine and a half, if you want to argue for argument's sake, um, I think it's a fair stoppage. Um, I'm not going to say he couldn't have got back into the fight, but... You know, ultimately, he to me, look, like he went down and he his senses were not there. And if you were the ref that looked into his eyes, you could probably see that. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you want to quickly touch on the uh, Lomachenko Linares? Yeah. So this weekend we've got Lomachenko Linares coming up. Uh, we've got two pound for pound fight fighters meeting uh, on ESPN. Uh, where Lomachenko is coming up from 130 pounds up to 135 pounds. Fighting the premier lightweight uh, in the world. What's your views on the fight, coach? Who's going to win? Um, interesting one, bro. Um, and half. I mean, you would argue that Linares uh, could potentially have some advantages in this fight, um, namely being height. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be telling in terms of how Lemonchenko fights in the inside on this one um in my opinion and the reason why I say that is if he starts letting off shots um uh, good combinations to the body and and definitely to the head i think Linares is somebody we've seen that can bruise um so it's going to see how, it's going to be interesting to see how Linares uh, Lemonchenko's power uh, will carry up at this division um is it a tough fight 100% is it a fight that gets my respect 100% um but I am still half torn into, are we going to see the type of Lomachenko performances that we're used to, i.e. Uh, a quit, the fight quitting or a stoppage? And I don't know. Um, but if it's a 12-round fight, I think that goes and that is going to be great for the fans. Um, and I think we, we're going to, I think we're looking at a great contest. I really do. But, I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, neither of them are notable knockout artists. That's, mm. that's, that's the first key point here. Right. The second point is Lomachenko is coming up another division, right? So he's, he's going to be the smaller fighter. Number three, they're both tactical geniuses. You know, Linares mm. is one of the pound for pound great experienced fighters. Lomachenko is clearly at the top of his game. Um, if Lomachenko does beat Linares and beats him comprehensively, like he's been doing all the way through, I think there's going to be very little doubt that he is technically pound for pound the greatest fighter on the planet at this stage on after what 11, 12 fights. I think it's going to be, I personally think, and I said this on a show many, many shows ago, that I think Linares is going to do his greatest challenge at 135 pounds, mm. most of them are last year. The reason being is I think he can beat him for his speed, because Linares is a fast fighter himself. I think his size will play a big part in this, you know, and, you know, don't, don't you know, Lomachenko is a massive favourite, but don't be surprised if Linares does put it off. Yeah. You know, he's a great fighter in his own right. Exactly. And I think he'll probably... He will probably go on points. Uh, yeah, I think he'll probably go on points. You know, yeah. He's probably going to look at the Salido blueprint and try and bully Lomachenko with his size. Mm. I mean, like, without a shadow of a doubt, I think that's number one in terms of... So I just want to go back and say, like, I do think, it, even though he's not a knockout artist, like he puts enough pressure on guys that they retire. So I think his stoppage, we've got to give Lomachenko his props and say he has a high stoppage in, in terms of opponents not going the full distance. But I do definitely agree with what you're saying in terms of Linares' speed. Um, we definitely would argue, I think it's to say he's the powers on his side. I think the other thing that's going to be on his side is the confidence and... I think verbally a lot of the opponents are confident, but I think Linares, 
is keeping calm, um, but I think he's going to be confident outside and inside of the ring. Um, there's there's quite a bit of distance um, that he's given away. So in terms of his ability to fight at range, uh, it's going to be an advantage. But this is why I think it's, it will be interesting from Lomachenko because the skill set is going to be key. Um, if he has the skill set to get in, inside, slip shots, slip the jabs, avoid the body shots, put the pressure on him, um, it, this is Linares, then I think... Lomachenko is definitely going to be, like you said, one of the most skilled fighters. Um, but I think this is a great contest because there are reasons for both for fighting and you ultimately will give Linar- uh, Lomachenko a lot of the credit for stepping up in weight. Um, but that's what, in my opinion, he should be doing because he's famed as pound for pound, but he hasn't unified a division. But if he wants to get more of a pound for pound ranking, he needs to be going up and winning belts and contesting tough fights. And there's no argument in his last three to four fights He's done that. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this one, mate. I have to say, I really am. <clears throat> I mean, in terms of a weakness um, of, from Lomachenko's part, do you think, what, what, what would be the key one you think Linares would be trying to exploit, if any? What, uh, what, what I'm going to say is the, the stoppages for Linares, I think, have come about mainly because his opponents have got so frustrated. You mean Lomachenko, yeah. sorry? Uh, Look. Sorry, Lomachenko, yeah, yeah. They yeah. come from, you know, Redondo, Nicholas Walters, you know, these guys have just given up. Mm. They've just quit on their stool, right? It's a question of whether Linares is going to do that, and I don't, can't see Linares doing that. Lomachenko, I can't see any, I can't, I can't see any weaknesses. You know, mm. right the amateur game, this guy's been top pedigree, you know. Everything he's done, he does is phenomenal. His punch variety, angles, the way he just moves, you know, his footwork, he's just brilliant, right? Mm. Linares does have some weakness in the sense that his face does get cut very, very frequently. Mm. He has gone down a few times as well, but I cannot see Lomachenko putting him down. Um, so, I can't see any, I can't see any weaknesses with Lomachenko. Yeah. Now, going back to the point that I said that most of his stoppages have come from fighters getting frustrated, can you see Linares getting frustrated with Lomachenko or do you think he's got the ability to meet Lomachenko head to head on a skill set level? And so, I, so it's difficult, bro. And I have to, the reason why I say that is because it's Lomachenko in the ring applying the pressure, making them get frustrated. When you're missing shots and you're getting countered, that is what creates the frustration. But I see your point. I will say this. Um, for me, uh, I think if Linares does get frustrated, I think we can only say that we would have seen a wonderful performance from Lomachenko. The reason why I say that, again, the reach is heavily in his favour. Uh, so it's in Linares' favour. So when he's fighting up close, to be missing all the shots the way he usually does, you know, make his opponents miss, for to be slipping, bobbing and weaving, and countering, in and out, um, on his toes, very nimble. Um, I think if he can do that kind of a performance against, again, Linares, I, I, I think it's, what, it's going to be a great thing. Can he frustrate him? I think, yes. You've you got to say he has. If you look at his last opponents... Um, Famed skilled fighters from Rigandau. Okay, Katie brought him up, um, but Sosa. Um, but I think he, he, there's no reason to say he can't. Um, but I would imagine um, if I'm going to pick anything, I think Lomachenko maybe stops Linares um, late. I think that's what I'm going with. Um, I'm seeing Lomachenko. Okay. I'm seeing Lomachenko okay. stopping him late, and I think it's going to be a good performance from him. That be, if he does that, that's going to be very, very, very impressive. I have to say, yeah. um, I'm going to, I'm going to counter that, and I'm going to say I'm going to go for the Nardis on points. Yeah, on the basis, you know, don't get me wrong. I think Lomachenko is the favourite, but I'm going to go with Nardis on points. You know, being yeah. a bigger guy and being able to meet Lomachenko. Uh, on a skill set level. That, uh, bro, don't like, that's, that's the whole boxing game. We all see it differently and we all get confidence yeah. from different things. So, yeah, I, 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 I can also see Linares winning, but if, you know, we all, as we have to do on this show, we have to be picked and answer a question. Um, so quickly before we go, because just, to, I'm sure that everyone, everyone's talking about it. Um, last week you were, you, you dialed in, but, you know, we've had a bit of more development in terms of uh, Wilder and Joshua. Uh, so, Hearn, Barry Hearn Sr. has reportedly said the fight, they got to do the numbers. and But if it was Hearn's choice, he would uh, fight Povetkin and Amila and then Wilder next year. What do you think of that statement? I'm 
but you know, there's two angles to this, right? There's a commercial angle, and then obviously, yes, what fans want to see, right? At this level, at the kind of money Joshua is making, he's going to be thinking about the money, right? right? If someone says to him, look, right, if you fight this guy, you could lose, yeah, you make big money, but you could lose it all, right? You lose your long-term ability to earn this kind of money, it's a risk, right? Or, you can make 20 million, 20 million, 20 million, in that time we build up the fight, turn into a $200 million fight, instead of this so-called 100 million, it's most likely Joshua is going to listen to that. So I think the likelihood is that's what he's going to do. It's probably going to be next year. I know what Sky he said, 95% likely it's going to happen this year. You know, but I think now that Barry Hearn has put that out, now bear in mind, no one is going to put that out for just for the sake of putting it out. Exactly. Right? It's always tactical. Now what is the logic? What is the reason for that? The reason for them putting that out is so that they can take away the, so the argument that's going to come that it's Joshua ducking him. So, right? so Joshua, Joshua's team can all return and say, look, we've given the advice, we've been advised by our promoters, and we saw sense of that, and we've gone for it. Mm. I think that's what's going to happen. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, still, I'm still keeping half positive. I'm hoping there can be some better talks. Um, like I said, I think... Deep down, um, I think even if that's their strategy, and I'm not going to say it's right or wrong, I think ultimately the bigger prize is now. Because as much as you're saying it's the 50 mil, which is the risk, the risk is there's the belts that you gain. And no matter what, his next two fights, he's not going to gain anything. Outside, okay, his standard paycheck, which we know he's the A-side. But what is he really gaining? Nothing. So really, actually, if we're looking at what he wants to add... There is only one fight out there. The money has been made. I mean, I think if they don't take this fight, is it a positive or negative look for them? Well, we've, if, you're, if any fight sign that's honest, right, we'll say it's a negative look for him. Mm. No doubt about it. You cannot dispute that, right? Um, but you know, because you know, boxing is full of deluded fans, mm. right? <laughs> but all it takes is for their fighter to make a statement which they probably know isn't true, right? And the fighter knows isn't true and then they would use that as a counter right? Take, for example, the whole is the 50 million pound genuine, right? Mm. Why is that your concern? Why yeah. is that the concern of any fans? Yeah. Why would these people come out with a lie like that? Exactly. You know what I mean? The only reason you're saying is you're preventing a fight from happening, right? So, definitely, it's not a look, good look. And if, there's any, if you're an honest fan, you will have to accept that because it's the biggest fight in boxing. It's a massive legacy-defining fight. It creates an undisputed heavyweight chance, something we haven't seen in a long, 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 long time. Exactly. Why do you want to risk that? Exactly. You know? Why do you want to avoid that? So, um, so last one, um, last thing we'll touch on is uh, obviously outside of a uh, Clem Butano, uh, Mexican meat scandal, we did have the Triple G fight take place against Marty Rosain. Um, can never get his name pronounced right, but listen, I'm going to cut to the chase. Wasn't impressed that he took that fight, made this guy come up from 154, stopped him in two rounds, which was telling, I'm going to tell you straight, guys, I didn't even watch this fight, didn't even bother staying up for this fight. Um, I think it's a shambles and, and for, for, for Triple G to kind of talk about Golovkin, uh, sorry, for Triple to talk about Hopkins um, and talk about his resume. Listen, even if even if Hopkins lost to certain guys like uh, Golovkin, um, Kovalov, and your uh, your Joe Smiths, listen, at least he took on very very tough opponents. I don't think you can compare the two. So for me, Triple G. So let's not forget. Let's not forget he lost when he was fifty years old. Yeah. Let's yeah. Not forget that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so. Um, you know. <laughs> And that's my point as well, you know. I like Golovkin sometimes, but at most times, right, his career, he's, he's, what he's done is just so, you know, it's just really taking the piss out of fans, yeah. you know. How can you not fight a middleweight? How can you tell me there's not any middleweight out there that would have taken that fight? Exactly. You know, what he's had to do is had to go back down again just to bring his back back up. I'm a killer. Yeah. Right? Because the, the time before Canelo, he couldn't do nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, I called him Canelo. Don't yep. forget that. Jacobs. Daniel Jacobs, he put, he put him down. Yeah, but that was probably more of an off balance thing. He wasn't really hurt, was he? Well, he didn't, he well, him. And, and he didn't finish real. him, exactly. You know? Yep, exactly. Right? And he didn't finish him. So, as soon as you stepped up, nothing's happened. So, what happens again? Go, go, go down, down again. Let's bring up a smaller fire. Like bringing up 
natural growth in yep. the division. Come on, man. If you have a legacy, you could have this fight, you know, or go up. You know, exactly. Five, three, go, you have a legacy fight, five, 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 and the only one, because the question you asked was, who is he beat? And on paper, he didn't beat Canelo. Um, so he doesn't have one because the rest of the guys, so apart from Danny Jacobs, so that's wrong. He has one in Danny Jacobs. Um, but again, you, I mean, on paper, he beat him. So I won't get into how that contest went down. But he, that's the only one, in my opinion. Um, you know, your Rosados, your Gills. I mean, if you look at these guys, their, 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 their records going into the fight, None of them were under. They were. I think maybe Gill was a one. Def, he had one defeat. Most of them had at least three or four defeats coming into the fight. So that doesn't suggest that it's going to be highly competitive. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm a bit frustrated with Triple G. I think he should have cancelled that fight um, or just called somebody from above. Called somebody from the higher rankings, even if it was a top ten guy. At least that would have made it more like uh, pleasing for us true fans. So. So yeah, so on that note, uh, I'm not going to keep you too much, but now you want to do the social media shout out? Yeah, guys, follow us on Rapsol TV on Facebook, Rapsol TV on Twitter, and Rapsol TV on Instagram. And don't forget, we're now also uh, having shows on YouTube, and uh, keep an eye out in the next few weeks, we're going to be streaming visual shows as well. Definitely. So guys, make sure you subscribe and like all the pages. <clears throat> Appreciate all the fight fans. Enjoy the boxing this weekend. We'll be back. Mm-hmm.